Welcome to another edition of What It Takes. I'm Tom Landon. If you didn't live in Roanoke prior to the 1970s, you might assume that the Berglund Center off of 581 has always been a public space and convention center. But there are many in our community who remember it with names like Diamond Hill and Gainsboro. There are many places in our region that were once bustling black neighborhoods that were bulldozed following decisions by white community leaders in the name of progress and urban renewal. My guests today are Jordan Bell and Roanoke City Councilwoman Patricia White Boyd. Jordan grew up in the area and is involved in many efforts to tell the stories of Black Roanoke. And Councilwoman White Boyd recently became involved in a documentary film project that tells the story of six places in Roanoke whose history is being told in detail using a mix of old and new technology in order to bring this hidden history into the light. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Very for glad us. to have you both here. Um, uh, Trish, I'm going to start with you just in terms of your background for people who don't know you, and this is being seen by people who don't live in Roanoke. So um, tell me about your background and how you got interested in history. Well, I actually did not grow up here in Roanoke. I grew up in the panhandle of Florida and moved to Roanoke in 1984. So I've been here a very long time and I was not interested in history. Uh, a friend of mine was telling me about her cousin, Henrietta Lacks, and got me interested in the story back in 1993 when I worked for the Department of Social Services. So I've known about Henrietta for a long time, just didn't really take her seriously until I started doing my own research. Right, and we'll talk about Henrietta's importance, Ms. Lack's importance to the, to the region and to the world yes. as we go forward. And, and, and Jordan, how about you? Uh, I, grew, I grew up here in Roanoke, uh, graduated from William Fleming High School in 2009. Colonel Pride. Yes, sir. Have always lived in the Northwest community. Um, and my family, my mother's side of my family, um, grew up in the Gainesboro area. Um, when they lived there, it was called 7th Avenue. Uh, which is Rutherford Avenue now. So a lot of ties to the Gainesboro area. And some of you might, uh, we, we recently had your brother on the program to talk about some other things. So yes, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, we're getting, getting both of you this year. <laughs> this is great. Um, so you grew up in Roanoke. What do you remember learning about black history in Roanoke, either in school or just sitting around the kitchen table with your fam family? Um, that's where the black history lessons came from. Uh, my great grandmother, Robbie Board, were ch was childhood friends with Oliver Hill. Um, and so I always remember seeing pictures of Oliver Hill and my great grandmother always talking about Oliver Hill. And then my grandmother and my aunt and my mom always talking about Henry Street and Borough Hospital and the Clater family. So the history that I learned were the, you know, the family stories um, sitting around the kitchen table or just sitting in my living room. Do you remember, was there much in school that you learned other than, you know, February is always Black History Month, and we always, you know, social studies teachers like me, that we really focus on that there. But, but do you remember it being focused on in school? No, when I was in school, there was no learning of local black history. Um, we always learned about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, but there was no learning about local black history. Um, it wasn't a few, until a few years after I actually, you know, got out of high school that I started to learn about local black history. Right, and, and there are a lot of efforts underway to tell these stories, and we'll talk about Hidden in Plain Sight and some of these other things, but uh, Trish, why do you think it's important for our citizens, not just black citizens, to know all of our history? Well, it's important here in Roanoke because uh, we have a pretty dismal past here in Roanoke City, and I think it's important for our residents to know uh, what the citizens and the residents here have gone through. Um, we talk about community healing. We talk about moving the city forward. We even talked about a public apology at one time. And it's important that we know the history and know these stories so that we can heal and we can move forward. And I think that's uh, part of the impetus for, for my project. Yeah, and I know in our conversations leading up to this show, you and I talked a little bit about you know, that idea of an apology, and it's like, well, who gives the apology? Well, what would right? that look like, right? Especially right now in Roanoke, where the majority of our city council is now minority or, 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 or female, and they weren't here when decisions Correct. were made. But it, it is, it, I think there is a reckoning that's kind of due. Um, Jordan, you often lead tours of Gainesboro and the area around it. Who comes to those, and, and are, how would you describe what those tours look like? Well, it's a different range of people that come to the tours. Um, I will say majority of my tours have been 
um, white people who live in Roanoke. Um, they're, they're interested in the history um, and they come to the tours at the Gainesboro Library. Many churches are involved in, in you know, scheduling and booking tours. Um, my largest tour was probably Juneteenth a few years ago. I mean, that was a very diverse group of people throughout, I would say, Southwest Virginia that came here for that tour during Juneteenth. But majority of the time, um, it is people outside of Gainesboro that come to the tours. To learn about to it. To learn about Gainesboro and learn about that area in, in, nor in Northwest. So in your case, you're talking about, you know, mostly what my wife and I often refer to as like people of goodwill who want to learn more about it. Um, what do either of you think we can do to make sure that the, the children of Roanoke and especially the children from Northwest and, 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 and black children are learning this history as so that they know that it's not just the history that's in the books, but there's more, there's more to local history. What do you think we can do to, to help schools help teach that and parents help teach that? Well, I know Jordan tours, uh, his tours really help a lot to educate all of us. I mean, even, even the black community. But I think this documentary will help some. Um, you know, we only talk about six sites and there are so many others, but um, information like that, information that's public, that is shared, is going to be helpful. And of course, uh, giving the kids opportunities to learn about this kind of information in school. They have put some bans on it here recently where they are limited what they can learn and, and what the, the schools can teach. We want to uh, make sure that those barriers are removed because we want our students and our children to learn about their history. What do you think is gained by learning the history uh, for kids to learn the history of, of Black Roanoke and of their relatives? Well, first off, it's important because then you find out where you come from. You find out the kind, type of community that you live in and the people who live there. So if I live in a community um, where a lawyer came from and a, a doctor and a you know, worldwide figure, if they lived right next door to where I currently live, then I, have those, I can have those same dreams and aspirations because somebody in my community, in my neighborhood did the same thing that I'm looking to do. So I think it's important as an inspiration um, motivator for, for our young people. Sure, sure. And you know, you're talking a lot about Oliver Hill, who's one of the most famous lawyers sure. in American mm -hmm. history, right? Yeah. Um, and his home has been preserved, right? Uh, I've never been inside. What are they, do you know, are they using the, the Oliver Hill Monument home for anything? It was um, Big Brothers, Big Sisters mentoring program a few years ago. Um, now it's not being used, but the community and the Oliver Hill Foundation are um, speaking and talking, figuring out ways that we can use that home now. Um, and the city of Roanoke is in that in those discussions as well. At least we know that the building has been saved, saved. and that it's, yes. the structure is good. I want to talk a little bit about um, the Hidden in Plain Sight project, Trish, that, that you brought to Roanoke. How did that come about? And, and just describe it for us a little bit. Well, briefly, Tom, I was watching um, a video on Facebook from a friend of mine called Hidden in Plain Sight Richmond. And it was talking about Lumpkin's Jail. And that, for me, was the impetus for, for Hidden in Plain Sight Roanoke because Lumpkin's Jail was the, the holding place for, for slaves as they were bought and sold. And it's just three blocks from the Capitol in Richmond. And people walk by it every day and have no idea that this was a place where the, the slaves were being held. I mean, you know, it's almost like sacred ground. Um, Seneca Village in New York, a lot of people have not even heard of Seneca Village, but urban renewal, 225 residents were displaced for a municipal park, and that park is Central Park. Oh, right, wow. Central Park. You know, nobody knew that this was a, re a home for, for, for black people and for community, um, it, but it was taken by eminent domain um, for urban renewal. They needed a municipal park, they needed some green space. And so let's just take 225 residents. And, um, and that's what, what made me think about Roanoke and the, and the sites that we have hidden here in Roanoke. And Jordan uh, was helpful in helping us come up with the six sites because it was very difficult. You know, there are probably 
20, 30 sites, but we, we could only do a few, so we chose the six that we've chosen, but, um, but that was the impetus for me um, to, to get motivated to do something here, Run up because we walk by the Berglund Center, like you mentioned, Burl Hospital. I mean, I don't know how, how much detail you want, but those are places that, that people walk by every day and they assume the Berglund Center has been there, but it was not, it was not. What, when you walk people through parts of Roanoke that are featured in this project, um, you know, what do you tell folks, for people who don't know, who, don't, who haven't read much about what was in the area where the Berglund Center was, what would that have been like to walk through that, you know, 70, 80 years ago? Well, I always compare it to a Charlotte or an Atlanta or New York, a real, a busy city, a busy town. Um, and that's what Gainesboro was, you know, in the 50s, 60s. Um, it was just a, a very busy area with businesses and hospitals and movie theaters and different things that was taking place. Um, and so people are just blown away when they're on the tour and seeing these different areas and they're trying to put their imagination to it because, of course, we can't picture, oh, the Berglund Center now used to be, you know, a thousand homes in a complete neighborhood. With um, a big hill, right? With, with a huge, a huge hill and schools and businesses so it's just it's mind-blowing to kind of put your eyes on that now or put take your mind to that but people are just you know fascinated by hearing oh this used to be here and it's not here anymore and then of course the question always comes of well what happened to it right yeah. and, and and I would like to add on that piece you know it started in 1949 with Harry Truman's um, Housing Act um, one billion dollars in 1949 a billion dollars was a lot of money and that was what was used to fuel the, the these localities um and virginia started um w with the commonwealth project and i'm sure you've heard of the commonwealth project and that was how it started here and in roanoke it didn't take long in 1955 city council did a resolution for 83.5 acres to be considered blighted in Northeast, and that's how it got started. And you know, when I look at those resolutions, I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I kept them, I printed them. I wanted to read the names of the council people, you know, who, who made those decisions, but, but that's how it got started here. So it was in the name of the Commonwealth Project that they, you know, demolished uh, a whole community, 83, almost 84 acres. Um, and thus, the Berglund Center, 581, um, Old Lick Cemetery. Ford dealership, a, well, yeah. a, a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, just the story goes on and on and on. And, and you know, we don't have enough time to, it, 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 it takes a documentary. It takes, it takes a documentary, a yes, yes, yes. But I would also recommend um, to anybody who hasn't read it or doesn't know about it, the excellent book by Dr. Mindy Foley Love, um, um, and in which she refers to um, Urban renewal is Negro removal. Ne Negro you know, this removal. Is what this was. Yep. Um, Plum clearance. There's a whole lot of names. And what? I mean, we can't put ourselves exactly in those people's minds. It was a time of segregation. It was a time of you know, uh, there was all kinds of stuff going on in Virginia politics and American politics at the time. But um, you know, do you think that it was the fact that the communities were so separate? Um, Black people didn't live in the parts of town where white people live, that it made it easier for those council members well, to do those things? absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, that little paper that I had, um, I quoted Mary Pickens. This is an interview that was done by Mary Bishop, and I always like to, to read that little quote. Mary Bishop, longtime Roanoke Times yeah. reporter, Pulitzer yeah. Prize winner who wrote about... Uh, so so, so this, is, this is Mary Pickett, who was on council at the time. Forty years later, she said, it had to be done for the good of the city for the good of our future. Their kids were growing up in slum conditions. That was prime growth land. Some people had to suffer. They just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And this was the mentality. Of a city council member. Of a city council member in Roanoke City. And you know, it is true that parts of that part of town were not as, they didn't have as many city services, but it was um, certainly not what, slum. What goes through your mind, Jordan, when you hear the word slum referred to, like what was go what, what what life was like in those areas? Well, you you have to speak to some of the people who lived in Northeast. Um, Carolyn Hubbard, um, who lived in Northeast, she was Carolyn Smith then, but she always talks about 
where we had fruit trees and beautiful gardens and my neighbor took care of my home and I took care of my neighbor's home and we slept on the front. It was it was safe enough in that area where they slept on the front porch if they had a sleepover or and of course there were neighborhoods in, in parts of Northeast that did not look the best. But majority of the area was a tight knit community of homes that were paid off, passed down generation after generation. And I think part of the reason that it happened in that area is they were just the easiest targets to get rid of um, during that time. They, and they the were, most powerless. And the and most, most powerless, powerless during that time. And they, and during that time, they did not receive any city services. I mean, there's some pictures of old Northeast where there's no sidewalks and there's still dirt roads, even though it was the closest neighborhood to downtown, which is, which is amazing to me that that community, the closest neighborhood to downtown is, was the least resourceful and the least taken care of for, you know, since over a hundred years now. And you think about what it meant for these people to own homes, two story, big homes, many of them with big porches, um, how much effort went into buying that land, building those homes at a time when they didn't receive the wages that mm -hmm. the white community did, that that they started out with, you know, way behind in terms of where they came from after Reconstruction. Um, and I can only imagine, I have heard, I have uh, conducted some interviews with members of the black community who were there then, and, and they have looked at me as a white person and just said, you just have no idea. Like, it's very hard yeah, for you to Yeah, it's very, understand. very painful. That was a very painful time in, in our community. And um, people are still trying to heal from that. I mean, can you imagine having your life savings just taken away from you right and then we're going to move you into public housing and this is yeah sure better, right? and and some of those folks never saw each other again i mean like jordan said they were a close-knit community and they were dispersed throughout the city you know they they would run into each other maybe occasionally but these were you know really close-knit families of course and, they, were and families. they were just dispersed all right. over the city i want to talk about the, some of the sites featured in the documentary and we've talked a little about gainsborough and Henry Street, we might come back to those a little bit because Henry Street is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. But um, let's talk about Henrietta Lacks. I know she's one of the subjects of this documentary. And um, who was she and why is she important to Roanoke? You know, a lot of people didn't know who Henrietta Lacks was, not just in the white community, but in the black community because nobody talked about her. And it wasn't like Rebecca Sklute, who wrote the book, discovered her. You know, she was, she was around as long As Rebecca before, would say. As Rebecca would say, yeah. But, um, but she did, she made this huge contribution to society with her HeLa sales. And we all know that it was um, from uh, a culture that was taken later, you know, um, Dr. Gay kept She had it. cancer. She had cancer, she went up, because there were a lot of places that would not treat uh, blacks during that time. John Hopkins was one of them that would, and she went there for this cancer. But it was really amazing because that sale lived, and it is still living to this day. It is responsible for the polio vaccine. It was responsible for COVID research to, to, to get the COVID vaccines, and it's still used uh, this day. And it's amazing because she was born right here in Roanoke. Um, she didn't grow up here, but she was born here. And it is just an amazing story of her contribution. Maybe the most impactful citizen of Roanoke ever. T right? To date, to date. I and mean, you know, even the World Health Organization recognized her a couple of years ago with a statue in Bristol, UK. You know, if the WHO can recognize her, you know, and she was born here in Roanoke, we certainly want to be able to memorialize her. So that was the impetus for the statue. And, and so the statue, there is a new statue going in. It going in her, her plaza, which was once Lee Plaza. We renamed um, a few years ago, Lax Plaza. So the statue will go there, but it's just an amazing story. And, and you know, we didn't know until recently that her home was um, not far, what, what was the name of the street, Jordan? Um, it was on, a, I know it was Prairie Park. Prairie Park. Mm -hmm. And her home was there, which was later destroyed, but we, the city had no idea right. that was her house. But, you know, talk about reserving, I mean, preserving history. We would have done the same thing like they did for Oliver Hill, but they didn't know that was Henrietta Lacks' home. It's one of those reasons it's so important to tell these stories. Yes. Um, one of the sites is Dreamland. And, and Jordan, I don't know if you know much about Dreamland, but tell us what, it, tell us what you know of it. So from what I hear from people who 
knew about Dreamland, and we have have a picture of Dreamland of people jumping off a diving board and inside the pool. Um, it was in the location of where the Gainesboro YMCA is now. It's in that vicinity. Um, but it was just a recreation center for African-Americans during that time. And from the one picture that I have seen, it was the place to be um, during that time. But it was just a recreation center with a beautiful pool that sat in the middle of Northwest Roanoke. Um, and it was, of course, taken away when the streets were widening through Urban Orange Renewal. Orange Avenue was Orange widened. Avenue. And yeah, it was also a dance hall too, which is right next to now after after they demolished Dreamland, you know, they had the, the Washington Park dump. Right, Washington Park, which was a park that then was converted into a dump. And, and, and now it's a park and um, the city is getting ready to do some renovations, but we're concerned that the EPA might say, hey, back off because of the, the, the fact, the that, fact it, that it's a dump. It was a dump. One thing helping in it may be that trash maybe wasn't quite as toxic back then. Hopefully, knows, hopefully, right? hopefully we were able to, to renovate the so, pool and everything. But it's just a lot of history right there in that Orange Avenue, Gainesboro area. Yeah, a lot of history. For sure. You know, where there is a municipal pool now. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, it's a, it, and it is a beautiful piece of land. It's that, a beautiful uh, piece of that, land. That, that holds Dream land, then a dump, then a park, then a... <laughs> Well, you know, every land can become many things, clearly. Um, uh, Burrow Hospital, um, what was the significance of, of Burrow Hospital? It's also featured in this documentary. Uh, Burrow Hospital started in 1915 um, due to the fact that Dr. Isaac D. Burrow, he was refused surgery the previous year. Um, he had a gallstone issue and he was refused surgery here in Roanoke. Um, and also in the state of Virginia at all major um, hospitals in the state of Virginia. So he, uh, Dr. James Roberts, one of his colleagues and, and Dr. Burrow's wife traveled over 200 miles to Freedman's Hospital on the campus of Howard University. Dr. Burrow received surgery, but unfortunately he passed away um, following that surgery. And that was, he had to take, did he take a train? He took a train, a train to Washington, D.C. Imagine that, and you've, you've got, having a gallbladder attack, and you've got to get yes. on a train and, and ride. So you're sitting in, you're sitting in a boxcar um, on a cot, just laying there over 200 miles. And so the following year, in 1915, um, Dr. James Roberts, Dr. Shadrach Wilman, Dr. Jerry Cooper, Dr. John Clater, and Dr. Lyburn Downing, also with the assistance of Miss Lucy Addison, started Burrow Memorial Hospital on Henry Street in 1915. And so that became the black hospital in Southwest Virginia for African Americans. And, yeah. and then about it's six which years sits later. On now, now it's, its current site is one of the most beautiful views of Roanoke. Absolutely. You go up there and look down. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And so the significance of Burrow Hospital is if you were African American, you know, from 1915 up into the 1970s, yeah. you were born, in Borough Hospital, your doctor was at Borough Hospital, your nurse was at Borough Hospital. Borough Hospital and Lucy Addison High School also had a nursing program that they uh, partnered with. And so if you wanted to go in nursing out of high school, you were able to take nursing classes while you were in high school at Lucy Addison. And also William Fleming later um, at Borough Memorial Hospital, just a significant institution in just the community. Has, I'm having all these thoughts about now where we're really trying to train healthcare workers for the economy that we have in Roanoke now, which is so healthcare based, and that that was already going on back then. Yeah, but like Jordan said, I just want to emphasize not just this area, but Southwest Virginia. Folks had to come from all over to, to get to a hospital. I'm sure many people watching this show, because our signal goes out all over Southwest Virginia, you know, have grandparents and things who, who were born there, born there. We have a few minutes left. Um, Old Lake Cemetery, um, is fenced and marked by the highway now, um, but what is its significance, Trish, to to Black Roanoke and Roanoke in general? Well, I mean, they had almost a thousand bodies, primarily Black, African American, people of color buried there, and of course they had to make way for 581, which was a part of the Commonwealth Project. But the, the thing that is really painful is that it was very expensive, so they had to use the Commonwealth Project in order to get it done. So it took a couple votes to get it even passed during, um, uh, you know, city council meetings. But they dug up almost a thousand bodies, and in their haste, moved them to Botetourt County. It, you know, out near Coiner Springs. Yeah, is that right? yeah, Coiner Spring, and but they didn't have time 
to even label the bodies properly. So it took years and decades to try to identify the bodies, which they still have not completely identified, for, from my knowledge. I think they're still struggling to, to identify them. So it wasn't the fact that they needed to be moved, but in their haste, didn't even bother to take the time to, to identify your cousins, your aunts, your, your fathers, your brothers. I mean, it's, this, that was painful for, for the black community. So you can understand why with, with the, the Berglund Center, the Olick Cemetery, Henry Street, I mean, all of this dismal history you know, how painful it is for the residents here in this area to try to still come to terms with what happened with the Commonwealth Project and urban renewal. Yeah, and unfortunately, believe it or not, we're about out of time. I, I just uh, want to encourage people to look for the Hidden in Plain Sight documentary. Yes. We hope to air it on Blue Ridge PBS Echo when it is released, and it's going to be screened at multiple places around the city, which I wanted to talk about, but we <laughs> ran out of time, so we'll that'll be for another time. <laughs> But as we close the program, I'd just like to thank my guests for making time to talk to me on the show. This, some of these topics are difficult and I appreciate it. So if you want to follow the project progress of the Hidden in Plain Sight project, you can do so at RoanokeHiddenHistories.org. And I encourage you to seek out one of Jordan's walking tours, often marketed on Facebook, of the yard and the environs around there, and uh, you'll get a lot out of it. For what it takes, I'm Tom Landon.